we're going to go to the word of God. Is anybody ready for the word of God? <laughs> Isaiah chapter 66, Isaiah 66 verse 1. This is what the Lord says. Heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. Where then is a house that you could build for me? And where will my resting place be? For all these things my hand has made. So all these things came into being by and for me, declares the Lord. But to this one I look graciously. To him who is humble and contrite in spirit and who reverently trembles at my word and honors my commands. So God is saying that heaven is my throne, throne meaning like a chair of the king that he sits on. And he says earth is his footstool where he rests his feet. The whole big earth is just his mere footstool. He's created them both. The meaning of this scripture is God is so big. He can't be contained to just heaven, for he actually created heaven. He cannot be contained to earth, for he created earth. Earth is the, his mere footstool. This is how massive our God is. And this is how uncontainable and limitless he is. So we must have the fear of God. Not think too highly of ourselves, not think not think that we have God all figured out exactly how he's going to move, how he wants to move. But we are mere a tiny speck of creation. If earth is God's footstool, then what does that make you? What does that make me? So tiny, tinier than a grain of sand or dust, right? So tiny. And what does that make then our brain? our mind that tries to understand and comprehend God in all of his ways. This is a humbling scripture. Hallelujah. We, we can't predict God. I mean, we can't predict what he's going to do, how he's going to move, he reveals some things to his people, to prophets. He reveals some things to, to others prophetically. He may reveal his plan, some of his plans, some of what he wants to do, but not all. He does not reveal every little detail, every little thing. He only reveals what he chooses to reveal. So even when we are, even if you are a prophet, even if you have a prophetic gift, you have to humble yourself and realize that still God's only going to reveal to you what he wants to reveal to you. You are still tinier than dust. <laughs> even if you're an important prophet, even if you have an amazing prophetic gift, compared to God, amen? God will use who he wants to use. We cannot predict who he's going to use. Leaders in the body of Christ he wants to raise up and use. We can't go by tradition, what we've seen happen in the past, what Bible schools tell us. We can't predict exactly who God wants to use. And we see this in the word of God. We see God choosing as his, one of his major prophets in the Old Testament, Moses, one of the biggest leaders of God, servants of God. He was a mouth, he was chosen by God to be a prophet, to be a mouthpiece of more than one million people. But yet he had a stutter, and he killed somebody. Nobody could predict that God was going to choose Moses 
to be a leader, and not just any leader, a leader of more than a million people and his mouthpiece, and, and this leader of faith that we look up to, that we learn from today, thousands of years later. God chose the biggest leader in the New Testament church, Paul. He wrote most of the New Testament. And he murdered many Christians in his past. Nobody could predict that that was who God was going to choose to write most of the New Testament and be the biggest leader in the New Testament church for us to look up to for generations and learn from and hear the word of God through in the word. Nobody could predict that. If, the, if, this was, if, if, it was, if we were alive back then, I, I'm pretty sure most of you here, if not all of, all of us here, could not predict that God would choose Paul. Right? Amen? We can't predict who God is going to use. And God one time even chose to speak through a donkey. Some of you haven't read the whole word of God. It's in there. It's indeed in there where God literally, the voice of God comes through a donkey. Nobody could predict that one. But yet it was still the voice of God. This is our uncontainable, unpredictable God. Amazing God. Massive God. Amen. We also cannot predict the miracles that God is going to do. Different, unique, strange miracles he may do. And those are the ones that we're not going to predict. Now, in Ezekiel 37, verse 4, it says, Then he said to me, well, actually, let me give you context before we keep reading here. In this scripture, what's happening right before what we're about to read, in Ezekiel 37, verse 4, is God says to Ezekiel, can these bones live? These bones that he brought him to in a valley, there was tons of dry bones, not just bones, not fresh bones, bones that had been there a long time. They were dry and God, God brings Ezekiel there to, uh, in this valley of all these bones. And God says, can these bones live? And Ezekiel says, you know, Lord. Verse 4, then he said to me, God said to Ezekiel, prophesy to these bones and say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you, and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you, and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I was prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling sound, and the bones came together, bone to bone. I looked, and tendons and flesh appeared on them, and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to it, this is what the sovereign Lord says, come, breathe, breath from the four winds, and breathe into these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath entered them. They came to life and stood up on their feet, a vast army. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. This really happened. This isn't a vision, a dream, an alleged a story. This is real life history. This is our history of our God. Bones all of a sudden had skin and flesh appear on them and then breath. And then people just became alive out of these dead dry bones. Wow. What a miracle. 
what a strange, weird, unique, unpredictable miracle. Amen? But it was God, nonetheless. It was God who did it. It was God who did this strange, unusual miracle. I imagine in those times, a lot of people would have been calling that witchcraft, thinking it was too strange, too weird, too out of the box to be God, not understanding how out of the box our God actually is. That's who he is. He moves outside of the box and he cannot be contained. Amen? And, and God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So when we read the word of God and when we get to know our God, how uncontainable he is, how he moves outside of the box, when we read a scripture like this, this should humble us, this should make us realize God could move in a strange way again. God could do a different miracle we never heard about. One that a lot of people may think, is this God? How could this be? This doesn't seem like him. Amen? We better humble ourselves and be ready for God to do any kind of miracle he wants, whether we've heard about it or we haven't. Whether we're expecting it or not. Amen? We also cannot predict the movement of God, where his spirit will go, like moves of his, revival, different moves that he is doing upon the earth. We can't predict where he's going to, where he wants it to be, where he wants it to move to, how it's going to look. When Jesus was born, the savior of the world, he was born in a manger. This could not have been predicted. This, would, this is the last place that anyone would think God would have this revival begin. The salvation of the world begin. It's, it's the last place anyone would think. But yet, God moved outside of the box and chose to move in this way. Jesus was also from Nazareth. He grew up in Nazareth, and that, had the rep that city had the reputation of just being kind of ordinary and nothing good coming from that city, nobody of real importance coming from that city. It might be kind of today like maybe like a really small town that's not known for anything and that nobody really came out of there doing anything significant and important in the world. That could not have been predicted, but God moved outside of the box and had Jesus come from Nazareth. God also moved, moved his spirit, the move of his spirit through Jesus, moved him to Africa and hid him there for a time when he was young, a toddler. He chose to hide him to, in Africa, and so the move of God, revival in Jesus at that time, at a young age, was in Africa, in Egypt. Egypt's in Africa. This was, once again, the spirit of God moving in a way we couldn't predict, we wouldn't think. Amen? And then we find the spirit of God choosing to dwell with the Israelites who had just come out of slavery. Slaves for many, 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 many years, hundreds of years. And God chose to dwell with these nobodies, these slaves. Those were his chosen people, the Israelites, amen? And he chose to bring them in the wilderness lead them through the wilderness for many years. For 40 years, you could say revival. I mean, the spirit of God, the move of God was in the middle of nowhere, in the wilderness. Nothing special physically at all. That's where God chose to be. 
I mean, God is all over the world. He's all over the earth. But like at that time, especially before the Holy Spirit was living in, every, in all believers, at that time, really the Spirit of God was the only people he was with were these people who just came out of slavery in the wilderness, in the desert. For 40 years, not just a weekend The Spirit of God was there in the middle of nowhere. That was the one place he was at. The move of God was at. This is not something that we would imagine we would predict. But this is our God who moves in a different way than we expect. Uncontainable God. Amen. And then there's there's the story in the Bible of Paul and Silas They just cast a demon out of a woman. And and after they cast the demon out, they were persecuted. And they were brought before the magistrates. They decided to flog them, to beat them severely, the Bible says, and then imprison them, bring them to prison and um, shackle their, their feet. And so outsider's perspective one would not assume that the Spirit of God was with them. A lot of people may be thinking, why would, if God was really with them, why would God allow them to be beaten so severely? Jesus already went through that, so why isn't God protecting them now? And, and God allowed them to go to prison? No. God can't be with them. Some people may think that, Right? But yet, revival broke out in the prison with Paul and Silas. Because the Bible reads that after they were in prison, a massive earthquake erupted in the earth and shook the foundation of the prison, the Bible says, so that the prison doors flung open and all of the shackles from all of the prisoners came off. And there was such fear of God that came upon the jailer that he immediately repented. He wanted to just die. But Paul and Silas said, no, no, it's okay. We're here. You're okay. And he says, what must I do to be saved? It's like the fear of God immediately came upon him. His eyes opened up to see that God was real, that the God with Paul and Silas was truly the Lord. And they said, you just need to believe. And and, and then he took them to his house, washed them, washed their wounds, and his whole household was saved that day too. And they prepared dinner for Paul and Silas. And then the magistrates decided, let them go, let them loose. They're not imprisoned anymore. So, wow, revival broke out in the prison. This place that we wouldn't, many people wouldn't think that's where the Spirit of God was at that time. That's our uncontainable God. Amen. I am that I am. God says, Exodus 3, 14. I am that I am. He says to Moses when Moses says, what if people, what, what, who do I tell, I mean, what do I tell the people when they ask who sent me? Say, I am that I am. That's how you describe me, God says. I am that I am. Meaning, we can't put him in a box. We can't describe him accurately. He's too big. He's so much more amazing than the word amazing. He's so much bigger than the word big. He's so much more uncontainable than the word uncontainable. I am that I am. And we humble ourselves. Our God is I am that I am. So when we think we haven't figured out, we better humble ourselves and realize he is I am that I am. Not the God that I have figured out. Not the God that I can predict. Not the God that I can be so sure about all his ways and who he's using and everything. I will humble myself and remember that he is I am that I am. 
I will humble myself and realize he's going to move in ways that I have not predicted, could expect, in ways that seem strange and weird and confusing. He is I am that I am. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Numbers 9, verse 15. Now on the day that the tabernacle was erected, the cloud of God's presence covered the tabernacle. Okay, so this is talking about in the, in the wilderness with the Israelites. It says that the cloud of God's presence covered the tabernacle. That is the tent of the testimony. And in the evening, it was over the tabernacle so this was like the temple that was built. They couldn't build a huge, an, a huge, amazing, stable temple that Solomon would later build because they were nomads. They were moving here, there, and everywhere because that's what God wanted them to be doing. So they, they built a, a, temp, a, a smaller type of like temple that they could uh, go with. That's where God would rest. The Spirit of God would rest. Amen? And so it, it covered... The tent of the testimony in the evening, it was over the tabernacle, appearing like a pillar of fire until the morning. So it was continuously. The cloud covered it by day and the appearance of fire by night. Whenever the cloud was lifted from over the tent, afterward, the Israelites would set out. And in the place where the cloud stopped, there the Israelites would camp. At the Lord's command, the Israelites would journey on. And at his command, they would camp. As long as the cloud remained over the tabernacle, they remained camped. Even when the cloud lingered over the tabernacle for many days, the Israelites would keep their obligation to the Lord and set out. Sometimes the cloud remained only a few days over the tabernacle, and in accordance with the command of the Lord, they remained camped. Then at his command, they set out. If sometimes the cloud remained over the tabernacle from evening only until morning, when the cloud was lifted in the morning, they would journey on. Whether in the daytime or at night, whenever the cloud was lifted, they would set out. Whether it was two days or a month or a year that the cloud of the Lord's presence lingered over the tabernacle, staying above it, the Israelites remained camped and did not set out. But when it was lifted, they set out. At the command of the Lord, they camped, and at the command of the Lord, they journeyed on. They kept their obligation to the Lord in accordance with the command of the Lord through Moses. So this is talking about the movement of the Spirit of God. So, you know, they could have journeyed however they wanted. They could have taken whatever road they wanted at whatever pace they wanted. They could have not kept going around the mountain that we talked about last Sunday how they went, circled around the mountain many times. They didn't have to do that, but they chose to follow the Spirit of God. The leadership, Moses, chose to follow the Spirit of God, even if it meant it was going to be uncomfortable, out of their comfort zones, even if it meant they were going to have to get up in the middle of the night, out of their sleep, even if it meant they would be in the wilderness for 40 years, there was only one thing that mattered, and that was that they would follow the Spirit of the Lord. They would go wherever he went. They wouldn't go their own way. They wouldn't go tradition way. They wouldn't go what felt right, their own emotions leading them. They would only go when the Spirit went, and they only went where the Spirit went, the Spirit of God. Hallelujah. And so, amen. And so this is, the, the scripture is powerful because it shares, like, in detail what this looked like. It doesn't just say when the cloud lifted, then they followed the cloud, and then they proceeded, and when it, when it rested, they then camped. But it gives detail that sometimes it was, uh, sometimes it was uh, 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 a couple days. 
Sometimes it was just from evening until morning. Sometimes it was a few days. So it, it gives us this detail that it was different. It was unpredictable. They had to be aware and ready. Ready to go when God wants to go. Ready to stop when God wants to stop. That means I'm ready to keep on going, but no, God wants to stop. We got to stop. Oh, I feel comfortable here, though. I love it here, though. But God's saying, let's go. Who cares what you think and how you feel? We must follow God. We must go when he goes and where he goes. Hallelujah. And I was thinking, God was, was reminding me again of our journey at Fivefold Church of following the Spirit of God. And I'm telling you, it's been 100% following the Spirit of God. And God has surprised me, me and, and us, of where he's taken us. I remember being very surprised when 2020 hit. And we had, to, we had to leave the building we had been comfortable in for a couple years. The building that was big, that had so much empty space that I had, I had dreamed and envisioned and declared that would be filled with people someday in this revival. But God called us to go out of there and instead go into a park. To have church in the park. And so we, we, we had a stage, we had lights, we had, um, we, had a full, we had a drum set, we had a full band, we had a sound person, we, we had chairs for the people in the church, we had shelter, we had AC, we had heat. And then one day the Spirit of God lifted and moved outside, that same park, but outside. And he said, he said to me, I'm moving outside of the box now. Those were the words he said. Take my church outside of the box. And I'm so glad that I've listened. I'm so glad that we listened, those of, those of you that were with us at that point, because promises were fulfilled from there. Revival broke out from there, but only because we followed the Spirit of God. And it had been four and a half years of believing in this promise of revival breaking out and miracles taking place and people being delivered and healed. It had been four and a half years of believing in that promise. And all of a sudden, God is calling us somewhere else, and it feels like we're going backwards, and we had all these things. And now we're out in the park with just a battery-operated piano, a tiny Bose um, uh, battery-operated speaker, one cord microphone, not even cordless, and one uh, microphone stand and one <laughs> music stand, and that was it. We had a 5F church sign, and that was it. But the Spirit of God said, go there. And um, from there, God called us to go to another park and 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 another park. <laughs> I don't even know the number. I gotta, I'll have to like count it. But it's been that many that I, don't, I can't tell you the number of parks. <laughs> and we would go from park to park for two and a half years. So it was like, it was three and a half years, uh, or th- about three years of having church. Like indoors for the most part. And then the Spirit of God moves outside and says, I want to now have church for two and a half years outside with nothing but the bare essentials. But that's where revival broke out. And so it it did not matter that we didn't have anything fancy, that we had the most simple, simple of things. It didn't matter because all we wanted was the Spirit of God All we wanted was his power and his presence. That's what we wanted more than anything else. Those other things are nice. But we wanted him more than anything else. Hallelujah. And God wants us to, as as church, he wants his churches to look nice and to have nice things. Do you know what heaven looks like? 
Heaven is gorgeous, like to the eye, physically. Here's a description of heaven. Um, it, Revelation 21, 19, it says the foundations of the wall of the city, they were adorned with precious stones. So here are some of the stones. Jasper, sapphire, uh, emerald, chrysolite, beryl, topaz, jacinth, amethyst, and more. That's what heaven's like. That's beautiful. Shiny. Bright. And so God wants it to be like heaven on earth in every way. His temple on the earth, his house of God, his churches, to be beautiful. To reflect heaven even in the physical ways, yes. And even we see Solomon's temple was built exquisitely. The walls and the floor were made from cedar, which was one of the most magnificent materials of that day. And gold was everywhere. That was the, the Solomon's, Solomon's temple. So God absolutely wants his house of God to be beautiful and have quality and high excellence. Amen? But God has a timing of when those things come. And God is not confined to those things. The Spirit of God was just as much with the Israelites in the wilderness, in the dirt, with no fancy thing, as he was with them in the promised land, with fancy things. <laughs> Hallelujah. And those two and a half years that we were in the park, God wanted us there. He had us there for a reason and a purpose. He didn't want us there forever, just like how he didn't want the Israelites in the wilderness forever. He wants us to come to a place with the, the sh beautiful things, uh, things of excellence and quality in the house of God to represent him well, to reach more people. Amen? Just like today, so many more people are able to receive the, the word of God, the, the power of God moving through the screen because of quality and excellence live streaming that's happening right now. No distractions, no things getting in the way like bad sound or something, right? Amen? Hallelujah. But when we were in the wilderness, in the park, God had a reason we were there. He was refining us there. He was testing us there. Do we really want him alone? Or are we there for other reasons? I remember praying to God the, f the first year that he called me to start Fivefold Church. We had a different name in the beginning. But that, that first year, I remember praying to God. You know, my eyes had just opened up to the power of God only uh, like a year and a half or so before I, God called me to start Fivefold Church. And I was a Christian my whole life before that. So I'd, be, I'd been to, I, I'd been in different churches where I, I noticed that people were there for not the spirit of God, number one, you know? There for other reasons, there for, to, to make friends, there maybe to look cool and show off their outfits, you know? There for a, a, co a great concert, a great show, I had seen that. I had experienced that. I had, been, I had been a part of that and not seen really those motives and everything until my eyes opened up to the power of God. And then I realized. And, and so my heart just burnt. There was this burden on my heart. My heart yearned for people to want Jesus alone. That's all they cared about. That's why they came to church. My heart, burned, my heart burned for that, for God. I would think about how that would make God feel, you know? And I would think about how when we aren't seeking God first and really desiring him first and desiring him to move how he wants to move, then we grieve the Holy Spirit. And we, don't, we stifle the Holy Spirit. We don't allow the Holy Spirit to move. So my heart burdened for this. So as God was calling me to start this church, fivefold church, this was my prayer. I prayed to God. I said, Lord, I want all the people that come to our church, for them to come 
for one reason, for you, to encounter you, to encounter your power. I don't want them to come for any other reason. I don't want them to come be only because of the music. I don't want them to come for an experience, a show. I don't want them to come to, to, to try to find a mate and flirt. I don't want them to come so that they can f um, feel good about themselves and with people complimenting on them on their outfits or something. I don't want them to come for a social reason. I don't want them to come just out of tradition and religion. I want them to come for only you and to encounter your power. That was my prayer. And that was before we were, that was years before we went in the park. And so then we went in the park and I, and God reminded me of that prayer that I prayed. And I realized this is a great filter. Like this is all we have. All we have is the power of God, his presence, his anointing. That's it. And so that was one of the reasons that God had us in the park. One of the purposes that his spirit, the spirit led us there is to filter out wrong hearts, to build a pure bride, a, pu a pure church, a pure foundation, that people were there for the right reason. They were there for Jesus, to encounter Jesus, and to see people be saved and healed and delivered, to be equipped to be powerful vessels of God. That's why they were there. So that was one of the reasons God was purifying his bride, purifying our church by having us there. Hallelujah. He was also testing our faith in him because though miracles were breaking out, there's huge promises and, and we're, that haven't come to pass yet and we're in a park, we're in the dirt. <laughs> you know, we didn't even have a, a screen for people to read the scripture or the lyrics. So this was testing us and our faith in him. This was also testing us if we're really serious about serving him and sacrificing, surrendering. Surrendering to him includes making sacrifices. Not sacrifices how we want, but sacrifices how God chooses. It was a fight to, it was a fight for me to preach and do the work of God sometimes. And it was a fight for the people, for you who were there, to receive because we were out in the public. There was a lot more that the devil could try to do when you're out in the public, casting out demons, preaching as an apostle and a woman. I remember one time, the very first time the demon manifested and was cast out, it was March 2021, and this woman traveled from across the country, from Massachusetts, just to encounter Jesus at our church in the park. When there was 20-something of us there, I was so expectant and excited for what God was going to do that day because I knew the principle of hunger. I knew that if this woman is this hungry, God is going to meet her hunger. In a way, I, I've never seen anybody this hungry at that point. So I was expecting, but God blew my mind blew me away, blew my mind, surpassed my expectations with the expectation that I had because that woman was delivered from a demon that day. And that was the first time I've seen a demon manifested as I ministered and be cast out. First time after ministering for three, three and a half years at that point. But that day, it was during the COVID times, we could not at that point rent, um, get a permit, get a permit for our amphitheater in the park. So it was first come, first serve. We had no issues for the most part, but one time we show up and there is an event going on of 60 or so people filling the amphitheater. One hour before the service was starting. And on that day, I know this woman's coming and she has a friend coming flying from Massachusetts. And on that same day, not a coincidence, two people from Nashville were also flying to come to our service to encounter Jesus. 
because videos had started to go around, go viral and everything. So that's how that happened and God moved upon them. And so I had to fight for us to have service that day. I spoke with a person in charge and I said, please, because they were finished, they had finished up and they were just socializing. So I said, please, is it okay? Can we please have the amphitheater? Because we have church service here every single Sunday. Do you mind if you just take it to the grass, like your party to the grass? And it was really a fight. You know, I had to really be strong in the Lord and just plead, you know, and eventually they agreed, but there was spiritual warfare happening at that point. And though they went to the grass, they started blasting heavy metal music. Blasting, just like 15 feet away, 10 feet away maybe, from where I was preaching. And we, did, we worshiped with the heavy metal music next to us. And, and I saw the people that, that got on the, you know, that traveled to come. I said, hi. And I said, you sit right here in the, in the, in the front row, and I'm going to come, and I'm going to preach loud, and I'm going to get close to you. Don't let the devil steal from you what God has for you today. Focus. Focus on the word. And so, and then when it came, so I preached the word just like, like the loudest I ever preached into the microphone. And, and this time, remember, we have just one little mic. <laughs> I mean, sorry, one little um, speaker. And after that, the heavy metal music is still going, and there's this party happening of like 30, 40 people just like 10 feet from us. And so then I start praying for that woman, and demons start to manifest in her, and, and, and the demon starts speaking out of her and says, I don't want her to preach. And then I commanded the demon to go, and the demon left her. Praise God. But hallelujah. But these people were even all watching and giving us funny eyes <laughs> as that's all happening. So we had to fight to, to do the work of God, and, and the people had to fight to receive. And I remember another time when we were in a, in a Lesion Park. Um, one time we, there was this gentleman that brought a picket sign and a microphone and a speaker and went on protest of us as a church because I am a woman preacher. And so he's just uh, speaking into the microphone, like protesting during most of the whole sermon. And so I just said to everyone, I said, focus on the word of God. Don't let the enemy take what he has for you today. And so I had to fight, you know, I had to fight to do the work of God and the people had to fight to receive. But like, all of that, God wanted to refine us through that. God, God, God was refining us into strong warriors of his revival army who are ready to fight, who are ready to be strong for Jesus, who are ready to sacrifice for Jesus. Because, you know, as people of God, I mean, I mean we want to like just, we want to sit in a comfy chair and, ha- and enjoy our Sunday service. There's nothing wrong with that. Hallelujah. I don't want there to be any distraction for you, you know, to hear the word of God, right? But in that time, God was allowing something to strengthen us. And so there had to be a sacrifice of our, like, traditional church ways. Amen? So that's why God, the Spirit of God, led us out there in the park and park to park Hallelujah. Praise God. So, <laughs> I thank God that he, that he is the leader of this house, of this church. I thank God, you know, that, 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 that he takes it. He takes the burden. You know what I mean? Like, he takes the weight, because this is his church. This is his, this is his church, amen? This is nobody's church. This is not my church. This is Jesus' church. And so I thank God that he has the eyes, that he has the direction, that he has the wisdom to do what he needs to do to purify his bride in this end-time revival. And to those of you in this church, to raise you up, to raise us all up, to be strong warriors of God who can be leaders who will be able to make disciples of the nations. This is what God is preparing you for. 
you know, and we got to get out of this mindset of a traditional church. Like, 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 like when you're not in the mindset of revival, but you're more in the traditional mindset of church goer. And so you have this mentality of what church looks like. You know? We got to get out of that. And we got to go to the Bible and be biblical and be like the Israelites who followed the spirit of God. We got to be we got to be biblical and understand that God moves how he wants and in, he's definitely going to be moving. He's definitely not going to stay in the same place for different reasons, for different purposes that we don't, we don't know the real reason sometimes. But we let God be God, and we expect him to move. We expect the cloud to move. We expect the cloud to then rest. We expect the cloud to move somewhere else, and we expect it to then rest. We expect it to move for a day or a week or a year. Or however, we expect it to not be the same pattern. We expect it to be unpredictable, and we will follow the cloud wherever it goes. Hallelujah. And so I say to you, um, just because God has lifted us in a new level, you know, and maybe even, even where we are, even this, this beautiful new location that we are today, even though maybe there's more familiar feelings of traditional church, it's, it's a way different from park church, right? But don't lose sight of what we are called to. Don't be complacent. Don't go back to the old mentality of just tradition and, and forgetting about revival and that God is moving mightily and he's up to something massive that we can't comprehend. He's going to be doing things beyond what we are praying, dreaming, thinking. Now to him who does exceedingly, abundantly, beyond whatever we can ask, dream, think, or imagine. Amen. Amen. And so, you know, I was talking about last Sunday. I mean, last Sunday I shared a prophetic word. If you didn't hear it, make sure you go check it out on Fivefold Church YouTube and, or my YouTube afterwards. But I was sharing how in the Bible the Israelites went around the mountain several times. The Spirit of God was just leading them in the wilderness. And then finally the Spirit of God decided to go a different way. And he says, you've circled around here long enough. Now go northward, Take, exit the roundabout, and go on, and, and God is saying this to us now, you're going on to the Revival Wave Highway now, all right? And so it's a highway, that means things are speedy, amen? So we have to be ready. I'm thinking of my sports days, my my dad's a phys ed, retired phys ed teacher and coach, but I played soccer and basketball. But like, you know, you're for the tip off, you're ready. You're in the ready position. We gotta be in the ready position. Ready to move. Ready to move. <laughs> Hallelujah, ready to go here when God says go here. Ready to go here when God says to go here. And when, he's, when we're going, following God and he says stop, we gotta be ready to stop. And when he says, go this way, we got to be ready to go and stop. When We have to follow the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God. Amen. And so be expectant, be ready for God to move out in out-of-the-box ways that we haven't seen yet before. Even where we have, even in, in even location of church, where we will be having church, be ready to move with the Spirit of God. God's moving at a fast pace. So, you know, whether he says go here for one week and we're here for just one week and we go somewhere else, then we go somewhere else. And then he says go here in this location for a year, then we go and we stay for one year. We go where he says to go, period. End of story. Amen? Because he is our leader, he knows best. And we will follow him and him alone. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. So, we remember how I shared in the park, God was 
refining. I mean, he was, he was making sure the right hearts were there. Making sure the, the ones that were ready to go, that they were the ones that were going to go. So I say be ready now because God's going to keep doing this. He needs his bride to be pure. Be ready to go. And we will go with who will go with us. We will go with who will go with us. We are a, we are a strong revival army. Amen. With high standards of purity, high standards of surrender, no compromises. We will go where God goes. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. God, I thank you that you are the leader of this church. I thank you, Lord, for leading us all the places you have led us for your cloud moving us here, there, and everywhere. For everywhere you have moved us, your spirit has been with us, your power has come, people have been healed and delivered and saved and equipped to be powerful vessels of God, and that's all we want, God. So we say yes and amen. We say a continual yes and amen for all of our lives, every day that we're on this earth. May we only follow your spirit. As a church, we vow to only follow you, Holy Spirit, to never get complacent or comfortable or go by our feelings, but we will make sacrifices. We will go out of our comfort zone. We will wake up in the middle of the night like the Israelites did if that's, what it, if that's when this cloud is moving, and we will follow you, God. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. God is so good. I'm so excited about his revival, this revival wave highway, and all of the new ways and out-of-the-box ways that God is going to move. That's going to blow our minds. Are you excited? Are you ready? If you're, if you're ready to follow the cloud, if you're ready to move with God, even if it means in the middle of the night or, you know, Whatever it means, are you ready? If you're ready, say, I'm ready. Yeah. 